Well, good morning and welcome to C3. Would you all stand this morning? We are so glad that you're with us. To those joining us on our live stream this morning, welcome to church here at C3. We are glad you are with us. To all our faithful watchers, welcome. Thank you for being a part of us. To all of you, thank you for being with us this morning and honoring us. Weather outside, kind of uncertain. We've gone from rain to sun, back to rain but it's great here because we can all say that today is the day that the Lord has made. And we're going to be glad. We're going to rejoice in it. We're going to do that together. I am so glad that you're with us this morning. Before we begin and turn this over to our worship team, I'm going to have you turn, greet someone. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. And then our worship team will lead us this morning.
let's just praise him this morning.
place to be than in the very kingdom where God rules. And the names at which God revealed himself to Israel of who he is, gradual progression in their journey to their final destination, which is the place of promise, is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He came and said very pointedly, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God has drawn near to you. And so his invitation is for all people to draw near to him because he is the fulfillment of every name of God. You just sang about he is the one who is your provider, your protector, your healer. He is your righteousness. He is your savior. He is your Lord. Everything about him is available to all of us. Every promise is found in him. So we take time out every week to pray that the very promises that are available to all of us will in fact be realized in our life. And so if you have a need this morning, we're going to invite you to come and we're going to have people that come by, pray for you, uh, agree with you that God will answer your need according to his will by his power as his promise assures us. Uh, for those watching us online, we're going to go back into worship. Uh, you can be praying for those that are here. But if you have a need, we're going to invite you to come at this time. If not, you guys can have a seat. We're going to continue our worship this morning. It's not one thing, it's another Caught up in words, tangled in lies But you are a savior And you take brokenness aside And make it beautiful, beautiful Will you call me child When I tell you lies so Take brokenness aside and make it beautiful, beautiful. You make it beautiful, you make it beautiful. And you take brokenness aside and make it beautiful.
morning, we thank you that in Jesus Christ is the place of promise, the land of promise, the very kingdom of you, Father. And each and every promise is available to each and every child of you. And I thank you this morning that those promises are revealed to us according to your will, according to your time, according to your power. And we thank you for that. Lord, we're asking that your goodness would be poured out this morning through your spirit upon each and every one of us. And that, Lord, that our worship as it has risen before you would be received in the way that it was attended as an offering of our life, a declaration of who you are as King and as Lord, that there is no higher court than you. You have the final word, the final say on every aspect of our life. For that, Lord, we give you praise. Lord, we align our lives and our will to yours. And we thank you, Lord, for the title, Child of God. We thank you that we are in your family. And that, Lord, very soon you will return for your family. So again, we thank you. We offer our praise and our worship and our lives to you this morning. And we receive every promise you have. For all of this has been asked in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to continue our worship this morning by giving to God his tithes and our offerings. And so once again, I'm going to ask our ushers if they will come at this time. As in our worship, we make a tangible declaration of God's faithfulness. He continues each and every week to be faithful. And just like every promise of God, those promises have a condition to them. We must do something to participate in those. Bible tells us that if we will acknowledge that he is the Lord of our finances and if we will bring that first part into the storehouse, it's up to him from that point forward to make sure that we have all of our need. To all of those who are in Christ, the supply of that need is in Him. And so we have been for 20 years realizing the truth of that. That every time there's a need, it's always met as we give. And we have been generous and continue to do that. So let's pray as we give. Father, once again, we come before you today. And we're asking again that you will show yourself faithful. That, Lord, that you will do what only you can do. That you will supply our need this morning. That as we follow your promise to bring in that first part, to bring in offerings for the various ministries, Lord, we know the truth, which is you will make sure that your blessing is poured out from heaven in a way that it cannot be contained. And so, Father, we worship you and we thank you and we ask that you will receive this in the way that it is given as a declaration of, of our trust in you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Because I am a sinner If it's not one thing, it's another Caught up in words, tangled in life but you are a savior and you take brokenness aside and make it beautiful, beautiful. I am a sinner if it's not one thing, it's another. Caught up in words, tangled in lies. Oh, yeah. You are a savior and you take brokenness aside and make it beautiful, beautiful. Oh, Lord, you make it beautiful, beautiful. Oh, Lord, you make it beautiful, beautiful. 
sit back and relax this week. I'm on the screen again and not in person. So uh, you can enjoy your announcement time. We're almost 20 and we can't wait to celebrate. Well, I mean the church is almost 20, not me personally. I'm, I'm older than that. So I guess I mean that we, our corporate selves, can enjoy the fact that we are almost 20. So please join us on June 19th for our 20th year anniversary lunch where we can appreciate how much we have grown together. It is also the last Sunday that Pastor Zach and Danielle Griggs will be with us. So join us immediately following the service for a lunch where we can celebrate as a family and say goodbye to a few of our own. Something exciting is coming on July 17th. We're gonna be having our annual church picnic here at the church immediately following the service. So I'm supposed to promo this for you. So here is a random clip from the church picnic. That's right. It's an adorable young Julian at a bounce house. Be excited. Thank you to everyone who gave time, energy, and donations to the teacher appreciation lunch and breakfast, I suppose. Thanks to your hard work and donations, we were able to give over three and a half thousand dollars to 217 hardworking teachers in our area. Actually, I cannot emphasize this enough. If you were there and you saw the genuine appreciation inside of their eyes, you know how much difference that you made. So being somebody who was there to witness it, thank you so much for all you do. Go to c3erie.info to find out what's happening here each week. Here we have our bulletin, sermon notes, and past sermons available here. If you're a guest, please stop by the Welcome Center just outside the sanctuary for a welcome gift. Now, please enjoy the rest of the service. I followed him too closely. I sat back, relaxed, and enjoyed the video and missed my cue. We had some fun with Josh during the week saying, you know, you're better recorded than you are live. <laughs> and so he worked really hard to figure out the glitch in the system uh, to be able to go back into recording. And uh, so he was uh, quite busy this week. Not only was he busy doing that, but he was at all four of the luncheons uh, interviewing and putting together, uh, will be putting together kind of a full report for the church. Uh, but to all those who helped, to all of you who gave, uh, a great big thank you. When we were talking uh, with some of the principals, the, just the impact that this church is making in the Harbor Creek and Iroquois School District, uh, it, it's, it's hard to even put into words. Uh, a couple of them got rather emotional um, over that. Teachers were... Um, really taken back, you know, and, and one of the things that the blessing of God does is it increases the influence and impact of the individual or group of people that are being blessed. And every week we close our service with a blessing. And if you, and you'll see this next week, we'll talk a lot about this next week, over 20 years, how the, how the impact in this area um, has grown. The influence and the, the reputation of C3 as a church has grown because of two things. Number one is your willingness to trust God and to serve other people. And the, the second part of that is just the fact that um, your, your generosity in the loving of a community to give of yourself is just kind of this ongoing uh, deepening of the blessing that is poured out. You're not people that are interested in containing that and holding it. It's always given away, and we're learning the game that God plays with us, that when we serve, when we give, he gives back and says, do you want to do more? And the more you do, the more he gives. And so it's an intriguing little aspect in the journey of trust. So I want to thank all of you. Special thanks to Pastor Steve. I am a big believer that wisdom is always proven 
uh, by its children. So when you make a decision, your, your decision that you make is always proven by what happens. And one of the best decisions that uh, this body has made was bringing him and Susan on staff. And so we're already seeing his impact, and I thank him for that. Uh, so just a big shout out to everybody, to Phil Gernovich, who is the owner of Lettuce Head. He supplied all of the salads. Thank you. And if you're looking for a salad, make sure that you hit up Lettuce Head. They are great. And so uh, we are so thankful for that. Um, also, just a reminder, um, you heard Pastor Josh talk about it. 20 years is a big deal as a, as a church. Uh, just like a little fun fact. Um, do you know that only 38% of all churches that are planted make it past four years? And so we are part of the 38%. And of those 38, um, there's like 32% of the 38% that fall into the category of some of the fastest growing churches in America. And so if you make it, and as you grow... It has this unbelievable impact in, in uh, the, co the community that you are. And then also, uh, we're going to look back over 20 years. Next week will be a little bit of a different service because we're going to be celebrating 20 years. We're also going to be celebrating 10 years of ministry with Zach and Danielle. We're going to say goodbye to them and their family, um, which will be rather difficult for me. So I'll have to navigate some of that. Um, and, uh, and then we will be looking forward to what God has next. So that just so you're aware, uh, people all, you know, will come up and go, so what's the plan? And I said, well, we have a plan. We do have a plan. Is it a perfect plan? Eh, not necessarily. But it's, it's a plan nonetheless. And we, we are walking through the process of uh, the individual that the Lord has for us next in that role. And so as that comes forward... Uh, you will know, and, and we will keep you abreast on all of that, but we are working in the transition now, and we think we have that uh, pretty well in hand. So with all of that, if you have your Bibles, let's open them to the book of Revelation. We are in chapter 20, which means we are steamrolling to the end of this, and hopefully you've enjoyed this uh, as much as I enjoyed. I didn't really, was not a big uh, revelation guy, so I, I've spent a ton of time researching, and um, there's plenty of stuff, up, probably several series that don't make it into the message that kind of get cut and are on the floor, and, and uh, but it's, it, it's an interesting aspect, and if you notice, the further that you go in the book, the less concrete things become. And so it, it's moving us, the book actually moves us into a place from where you come to this um, beginning of a journey in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ that starts with faith and trust in him. Now it moves us through scenes throughout history into what's going to happen at the end of time. And some of this uh, the Lord wants us to know, others he wants us to trust that he knows. And so this last few chapters puts us in the realm of trusting that he knows and that we get some glimpses and snapshots of what is coming and what it will look like. How this all plays out, I will be perfectly honest with you. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I have ideas and that's kind of what I will, will give to you. But we are in the second part of Revelation chapter 20. We will be in verses 11 through 15. So kind of a shorter, compacted part. This part is all about the great white throne and the judgment. So last week, if you were with us, if you're just joining us uh, on our, our live stream, uh, we talked a lot about the millennium, this thousand-year period um, or what is referred to really as the golden age of the church. This is the living in the land of promise. Everything about this is, uh, is great. There are um, the people that are part of this are people that are brought back in the first resurrection, uh, those who are alive on the planet that survived throughout the great tribulation, 
everything that would be um, viewed as evil, wicked has been removed. The Antichrist is gone. False prophet is gone. They are in the lake of fire. Uh, uh, Satan was bound for this 1,000-year period. And during that, the church is ruling with Jesus Christ, who looks like he's ruling right from Jerusalem. And so he is there on this planet for 1,000 years. And during this time, it appears that the population will continue to grow. We are there with him. We have been raptured. We have our glorified body, and we are helping during this thousand-year period. At the end of the thousand years, the pit is open, Satan is loosed, and he comes flying out. I'm adding just for dramatic aspect. And is in a fast and furious, we don't really know the length of time because we're not given that, moves around the nations to deceive the nations as far as what is referred to as the original enemies of God, of God known as God and Magog. So there's kind of actual locations. Some believe it's in the area of where Russia is, the Ukraine, and that part of the world, and amasses all of the people or deceives the people who have been living under the absolute blessing of God in a common grace, common blessing uh, for a thousand years. So they're not aging, they're not dealing with sickness, they're not dealing with sadness, they're not dealing with any of that. But how many people know for an individual to come to Christ, they must voluntarily surrender and submit their life to him? These people will have to do that. <laughs> He deceives and generates this uh, army that is going to be his second attempt at overthrowing Jesus. So Satan is kind of a numbskull, kind of a thick-headed individual, kind of his, you know, whatever kind of a skull he has is like triple thick. And so he never seems to get it through his thick head that he cannot defeat God. So this battle isn't even a battle because we were told fire comes out of heaven, devours all the people. So this is kind of like uh, Elijah on steroids. And so all of these people are simply wiped out and removed. The scene now changes to what happens immediately after that. And it's one of the more interesting kind of troubling at the same time, but yet really glorious scenes that all of us who follow Christ uh, will be present at and witness this. So let's take a look at this because we're going to see uh, what is referred to as uh, the second resurrection. And uh, if you are part of the second resurrection, just note this, not a good thing because you get to stand before the great white throne of God. So beginning in verse 11, John writes, Then I saw, so immediately after everybody is put into the lake of fire, he says, I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. So, them would refer to a group of people as well as the condition of something that was old. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That puts a period and an end to everything evil, wicked, anti Christ, anti-God, 
all of it. Anti written word of God, it's gone, it's removed. And now we will move into this wonderful, wonderful period um, known as new creation of the new heavens and the new earth. So let's take a look at this. So we're looking at the judgment of the wicked, really, is, is kind of what this passage is going to be. And the first thing that we are told, really, is the place or the location of judgment. And um, we are given the location as around a great white throne. So this is a place where unbelievers, all of those who did not follow Christ, will not only stand probably on the sea of glass that we, we saw earlier, the great white throne will come down and they will, they will now see Jesus Christ face to face. So they're going to see God the way that John saw God in the very beginning of this book. So perfectly as he, as he was described by John. And if you can only imagine John who knew Jesus goes face planning what the level of fear will be in all of these people. So they are standing there. They will see uh, exactly what John saw. And guess what they will know at that very moment? They will know that they made a huge mistake in rejecting the salvation that was offered to them through Jesus Christ. They will understand that their deception was self-deception. They will understand that they did not want to submit and surrender to God's word, God's principles, because inside of them they want secretly to be a God. They have problems with uh, submission. They have problems with surrender. Uh, they have problems with um, the whole, the whole uh, concept of God being good by nature. And so everything that, that happens, they really will be struggling. And they will understand at that moment the mistake of living for the pleasures of this world and loving this world the way they did. And they are going to be standing, by the way, on the last moments in which this world exists. So what they love, they're going to be standing there. All the pleasures, all the pride, all the status, all of the toys, everything that comes with this world that they embraced, they will know at that moment it was a facade. It was fake. It wasn't real. And they bought into it, and they willingly bought into it. And if you notice, they are standing in front of the great white throne. There is no cross present. All of us have stood in front of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's not available at this moment because their life had ended. The only thing that they get a, a chance to stand before is this throne itself. And so the, the throne is said to be great. So the picture there uh, or the, the word great kind of talks about the fact that there is no throne greater than, higher than, there is no, that, that the throne is completely sovereign, it has all power, that you can't appeal any decision that comes from this, this throne. You can't string it out, you can't file uh, motions and go, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to drag this out through all eternity. There is no appeal process at this point. It is a great and kingly all sovereign, all powerful throne. So everything that is is happening with this, it's white because it is pure, perfectly pure. In it, there is no lying, there is no deception, there is no sin. It is perfectly holy. It is like no other throne or court system that has ever existed in human history. Every court system was supposed to mirror this and copy it and match it. This is, the, this is the model of, um, of justice right here. It is pure. So there won't be anything other than pure justice that will come from this particular throne. And so the fact that people are standing in front of something that is pure, 
perfectly just, they will realize that nothing impure or unjust, that nothing unrighteous can pass this throne. So they are standing there, and they are now um, facing this whole aspect that the only way to have passed into God's new world will have been through the cross. So everyone that has done that will be off in the distance watching all of this, realizing that it was only through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ himself who gave his life that whosoever would believe, whether great, whether small, whether significant, whether insignificant, whether front side of the world, back side of the world, anyone who would believe would have entrance. They chose not. And so now they will have to give an account as to why they have not. So um, it will become very, very real that there is now no escape. And I would say for all of us, things like Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, will also be standing there and becoming made real to us. And whether we will hear this, remember it, whatever, how shall we escape if we ignore such great salvation? It will become obvious to all of us and all of them that there is no escape. Hebrews 12, 25, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who wanted them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? There will be continual, continual reminder of what they failed to do in front of them. And it will be perfectly just, and they will know. They will know that. So the location of this judgment, right in the, the great white throne, probably on the sea of glass, the time frame of this we are given. Uh, now, it appears thousand years there's time because it's a time frame given um, but they don't all we know is this happens directly at the end of the thousand years but where uh, the time frame itself here is when uh, heaven and earth will flee from the presence of God and so um, this right here is more of a just a kind of because we're, now we're going to jump back into apocalyptic literature so this is more poetic than anything else, okay? It's more of a John's way of giving kind of a poetic description um, of how the heavens and the earth will be destroyed. So in order for chapter 21 to happen, chapter 20 has to occur. The only way a new heaven and a new earth can come to pass is if the old heaven and the old earth end, the period of history ends, or you could say, or it's destroyed. Now, we know, according to Jesus, that it will be destroyed by, by fire, um, and it, it's going to happen in conjunction um, with all of these uh, people that have lived that have not. So, you know, kind of wrap your mind around it. How many people have lived on, on, on planet Earth from uh, post-Eden until the end of a, of a thousand years. So you're talking billions and billions of people are standing there and he they're going to watch heaven and earth flee. And so for all of the great scientists who tried to think of like a big bang or whatever and however this started, it's probably going to end the way it started and God will speak. And there is going to be a bang and explosion after explosion and fire and they are going to watch the destruction of the cosmos and of the world they so loved and were such a part of burn up right in front of their eyes and so 
the, the, what, the, what Scripture will say then is the heavens and the earth will flee away and there was found no place for them. They will understand, the billions and billions of people, there is no place for them in this new world. The only place for them is what is happening in the world they loved. You wanted it, now you get it. And God will grant them out of his justice what they've always wanted, their world. And that world will be hurled into the lake of fire. It will no longer exist. And they will be standing there uh, watching the destruction of it. So what does that mean? There is no longer a world for unbelievers. There is no place for it completely destroyed. Uh, the Apostle Peter, in his second letter, prior to his death, he writes in chapter 3, verse 7, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So these two are linked together at the end of time. Jesus told us in Matthew 24, heaven and earth will pass away, but what will stand? His word. It will never pass away. Isaiah prophesied all the way back. Behold, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. So in the new heavens and the new earth, it, when we get into chapter 21 and 22, there won't even be a memory or a thought of what, what this world was really like or how lousy it really was. It'll be so wonderful. You'll be like, eh, I really can't even, can't even remember how lousy it was. So we've got the location, great throne, the great great throne. The time is at the end of the, the thousand years. Heaven and earth, the world is destroyed. And third, we are told about the people that are present during this. Look at verse 12. And I saw the dead, both small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. So who are the people that are being judged? We are told there are two categories of people. First category is ordinary. These would be the Jimmys and Joe Annas, if you would. See, these are common, everyday people. Um, you know, you could say these are the people that, you know, really nice, good people, never really did a whole lot. Um, you know, didn't come to Christ, didn't want to hear about it, didn't believe in it. Uh, Blue-collar workers, maybe, um, employees, working class, all of these people will be judged. Those who function as servants, those kind of people, ordinary people, they will be judged. Those who commit sins that society considers eh, insignificant, not really a big deal, everybody kind of does it. So even the minutest of sins will be judged. What kind of sense? Well, you know, kind of laziness. People who grow up and live in their parents' basement and play video games all day, and I digress. Uh, people that are self-centered, selfish, indifferent, those who are given to gossip, backbiting, slander, those in immorality, those who lie, create lies, live in lies, um, those who really are um, people who are given to stealing things, all of that whole category, they fit into that category. So the ordinary people, they will be judged. The second category, he says, is the great. So these are great men and women. They will be judged. Um, your people that are in positions of authority, uh, those who have t a tendency or had a tendency when they lived to abuse authority, take advantage of other people, maybe neglect others. These would be the people that, you know, Jesus talked about giving a cup of cold water and, and embracing others, and they weren't interested in giving cups of cold water. They were interested in hoarding cups of cold water, all of that. Um, those who murder others, they will... Uh, they will be judged. Those who flaunt their sin, don't care, revel in it. Um, all of your um, world leaders, politicians, presidents, prime ministers, um, people of great authority over nations, all of that, they fit into this category as the world will have called them great. 
Uh, the bottom line here is no one is exempt and no one is overlooked by God. They are all present, and guess what? The playing field is completely level. They're all standing before him. And uh, each of these individuals, whether they are ordinary or great, will have their moment before the king of kings. So they get a chance, as we'll find, to explain themselves for their choice that they had made. Uh, Paul writes to the church at Rome, this will take place, this judgment, in the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. Remember, Jesus said that God sees everything and what is hidden in the secret places will be made public. So for all those who think we may never know what's going on behind the scenes, it'll all be uncovered. Because God sees and knows everything. In Romans 14.10, he says, You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we shall all stand before God's judgment seat. Now remember, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ for rewards. And so the book of records is open for us. Just like it is for them. What we have done since the time of asking Jesus Christ into our life, that is what is judged. It is either rewarded or it's burned up and thrown away. So there is a sense when we stand before the Lord that there will be loss, that you know what, I probably should have did this or I shouldn't have done that. There will be a little of that, but you are not judged for your sin condition. Because you don't live in the order of Adam, you live in the order of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. That's the transition that is made at the cross. You move from death to the resurrection to life, from the order of Adam to the order of the second Adam, Jesus Christ. That order, you, you have nothing to worry about. We stand and we get to give an account for everything we do. So that may be fun or may not be fun. It just depends. So those are the people. Now, what's the basis for judgment? Because everybody's going to be, you know, you're going to have these people that are going, this is unfair, and, you know, but I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and, and eye disease will be coming, you know, just be, being spewed out as people are in full-on panic. Um, there is a basis for judgment. Look at verses 12 through 15, through 15 because this is the end of this. Um, the second part is... Um, they're standing before God and the books, now notice this, the, the books are plural and they're opened and another book was opened. So there's a second book, which is the book of life and the dead uh, were judged according to their works by the things that were written in them. And then we'll see later that the sea gives up the dead. And those who were within it, death and Hades, are going to deliver up the dead who were within them. They were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were no longer needed, so they're cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. We're told anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So God has a library, kind of his study, if you were. And there are books, two types or two categories of books in his library, according to what John is telling us. The first is called the book of life. Inside of the book of life, everyone who is born, their name goes in it. So every person who has lived, conceived all of that, heartbeat, their name is written in the book of life. And so... Um, you got to remember that we use Scripture to in, in, interpret Scripture. So God, from the beginning, has always intended that we would live with him, that we would be his people and he would be our God. And so life comes from God. Your name is put in the book of life. And um, people's job or, or, or our goal as humanity is to know, to love, and to serve him. The only way that can be... Um, because of the fall of man, the only way we can enter into life is through Jesus Christ. So what happens if you don't? If you don't, your name is blotted out and removed. So it is an unpardonable sin to die apart from Jesus Christ. 
you no longer have life. So there is a black line that, or your name is just pulled out of the book, however they do that in heaven. Um, and, and you are, what have you done? You have forfeited your right to be a citizen in new creation. That's what happens at that moment. So all of the people whose names are not written in the book of life or who have been blotted out are standing there. So billions and billions of people. So let me give you a little bit of context of this. All the way back in Exodus chapter 32. Remember Moses when God was going to wipe out everybody? And he goes, no, 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 wait a minute. Wait. He goes, but now, please, forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. So Moses knew that there was this book. To take me out rather than them, I'll pay the price for this. See the, see the comparison to Jesus? Okay? And what does God say? God, God responds to Moses and says, no, no, no. Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. You can't do what my son will do. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, talking about the very end time, he says, But at that time, the angel speaking to Daniel, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book of life, will be delivered. So they will get out of captivity, bondage, condemnation, judgment, all of that. So that is us. Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 20, Do not rejoice, remember this, that your spirits... Uh, the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are, what, written in heaven, in the book of life. So celebrate that. That's the first book. So what happens if your name is blotted out? Well, all these people now will experience the, the rest of God's library, which are referred to as the book of records. So these are um, the records of all the works of everyone who has lived, especially these will be the works of unbelievers. So when a person's name is removed from the book of life, then the book of records are opened and they will be judged according to them. So they will hear an account of their entire life and they will have to then be able to argue as impure, wicked, evil, unsaved, still with the mark that is on their soul, how they're innocent. So after every line, you may hear in the background the drum kind of beating, guilty, 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 guilty. And so what they will understand and what everyone there will understand as they have their moment before the Lord is that the justice and judgment will be exact. It's not subjective. It's not, oh, well, you know, I understand. Oh, they're just... That's just them being them. There's no, I, I didn't know you were real. I, did, I thought those people were crazy. There's no argument. It's going to be exact and it will be fair. Because in the presence of holiness, remember, nobody stands. So there's all kind of... I would imagine shaking and quivering and every secret sin, every lousy thought, everything that was done backhanded, every little, you know, maneuvering, manipulating thing is all going to come out. You know, and, and remember, these people have, this is their resurrection. They've been dead. They haven't, they haven't experienced one second of the golden age. They have not experienced one iota of what, what we had in a thousand years. When, they, when a person dies, they stay dead apart from Christ until this moment. And so they're brought back to hear this for what awaits them. And so everything that was done, um, unforgiveness, ill feelings, everything, things that were done by them to them, all of that that created this wickedness of the human heart from which evil has flowed, uh, they will have to deal with that and they will be perfectly judged. Second thing that happens in all of this is um, 
this resurrection of the dead that we just at least need to tie, you know, just to kind of touch on a little bit in verse 13. Um, remember, the first resurrection had already taken place before the thousand years. This one takes place at the, uh, at the end of the thousand years, and this is only, as we said, for the unbelievers. Uh, so they're coming up from everywhere. Um, you know, the depths of the sea, so all the oceans, all the seas, all the lakes, everywhere that people have died, plane crashes, you know, uh, people that were uh, cremated, they're, you know, whatever thrown out, their uh, ashes dispersed everywhere. God knows where every atom of every person is, is the point. And he will bring them back uh, from wherever they have died uh, there. Then from the grave, the grave will be forced to give up all that are in them. And so that is really the, the, the term um, that we have here of, uh, of Sheol, uh, the grave itself, um, and um, Hades, this place where Hades, just so that you're aware of it, when a person dies apart from Christ, they don't go immediately to hell. They go to the holding place called Hades. It's referred to as the land of the dead in the Old Testament, Sheol. It's a kind of a place where you are awaiting reunification with your body wherever it is to stand at judgment. And then the other term that was used in the, in the Bible, Sheol, Hades, and Gehenna, uh, was a, a Hebrew term which meant fire or the place of burning. It was in the Valley of Hinnon where they took all the garbage out and they just incinerated and that place just burned and burned and burned and burned and burned. And it was like this ongoing fire in ancient Israel during those times because they did not have waste management. So they burned all their garbage. And so uh, all of this um, comes from uh, all these people are brought back and they hear their judgment and they realize at that point after watching the worlds be destroyed, um, all that's left is punishment. And punishment for them is um, verses 14 and 15. And they are all uh, sentenced to eternity in the lake of fire. And um, where the Antichrist, the false prophet, the fallen angels, Satan himself are, they join because that's what they followed their entire life. And my guess is that's the last scene of the old order, just kind of that's the last explosion of everything, and that is where they will stay uh, for all eternity, completely separate uh, from God and from everything that is holy, righteous, and sanctified, which would be us. So there is no communication from that point on. And that all kind of ends that. And so really next week, it's us then going, oh my gosh, look at this. As we watch creation for all eternity take place. And I can't even wrap my mind around. And that's why I think it's just kind of symbolically given to us. And it's not like it's, this happens and this happens. It's kind of the six-day thing happening all over again and everything pictured at what it looks like when, when God makes good on his, prom his promises and as God says, I'm going to be with you for all eternity and this will now be perfect because everything imperfect has been removed. So what do we walk away from this morning? I'm going to have you just jot a couple things down um, in, our, in our last few minutes. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, the toughest thing for me is to take the information I give you and then say, okay, here's what you want to walk away from. And I didn't want to say I want you to all walk away going, yes. Because <laughs> um, it, it won't be that. It, it, it'll be just kind of a mouth open, like kind of, wow, I that just, I, I can't even think of what that will be like. It's just, I think it's going to be horrific. Um, but for us, I think as we're, as we're moving through this period of history in which we live, I think Revelation drives us back to 
um, really grasp and be immovable on some foundational truths that are under attack right now, that will be under attack until the very end. And so I think some of the things that, um, I believe two areas that I think I want you to, that I want you to write down is in these days we need to be immovable uh, when it comes to our understanding or comprehension, however you want to phrase it, uh, of God's love, what motivates his love, if you will, and his uncompromising faithfulness. So his love and his faithfulness, we have to be immovable in that. Because even in uh, progressive Christian settings, Luciferian doctrine, philosophy, however you want to say it, works, it has worked its way into the church. And I will say it, it's probably done that for well over oh, 300 years at least, maybe longer. There is this kind of a sense um, that God isn't always good, um, that God doesn't always do good things, that God allows things. Have you ever heard that God allows certain things? God doesn't allow that. God is only good. He is only loving. To say that he allowed someone to have cancer or he allowed a storm and, you know, somehow he still, that's not true. That's, that comes from Luciferian doctrine. Luciferian doctrine attacks certain things about God. First one it attacks is creation. It creates a different story of creation. It creates a story that creation isn't basically good. It attacks the creation of man in the image of God. That man is not necessarily created just like God. How do I know that? Because the attack right now is in the beginning. He did not make them man and woman. It attacks marriage, relationships, the value that God places on humanity, on children, all of it on how loving God is. It continually does that in so many circles. It paints God as distant. It paints him as kind of an angry God. And it attacks the doctrine of sovereignty by saying that God does play favorites. And so we have to be really careful. And when we're done with this, we are going to go on a long journey, maybe as long as a year to a year and a half, of just deep understanding of what it means to be a disciple, what it looks like to be a disciple, how to lay hold and live in God's kingdom on an everyday basis and what it really truly looks like as a submitted and surrendered individual to Jesus Christ. And so one, one way that we do this, by the way, is we come back to the foundational truth of the word faith. What faith really is and how faith is how we live, how we move, how we walk, how we function in this world. I, I, one of the guys I, I, I have in my, in my library is a guy by the name of Kenneth Wiest. And he writes a description that I think is the best when he, when he explains faith. And I'm going to super simplify it because theologians have a way of liking to read themselves. So I took it and I broke it down to this. That faith at its simplest place is trust. And it plays out in trust or confidence in a person's character and motive. So we have to be 
unmovable, unshakable in our trust of God's motive and character. That he is good, not mostly good, he is good. And that everything that was written as God reveals himself in the Old Testament on this journey from captivity to promise is fulfilled in Jesus as the second Adam that leads us from captivity to promise. And everything that happened in provision, protection, healing, all of that is found in him. So we have to be unmovable in our day, discerning in our day, to, to really settle the fact of who he is and have confidence in who he is and what he will do. Now that sounds so simple, and it is really simple. It just lives horrible. Because you get bombarded with everything that will be counterindicative of that. That you're going to get hit with times of, well, there is no provision. You're going to hit times with sickness. You're going to get hit with times of, of feeling like you're not protected. You're going to hit times with chaos and confusion. You're going to get hit with things that are broken in you that are just continually being played out in this somewhat lie that, you know, fallen humanity is a, is a cracked mirror. It's not a clear image. You are re-imaged clearly in Christ. That in Christ, there is no length that God will go to for you. Because he sees his son when he looks at you. When he looks at you, he does not just see you. He sees Jesus Christ and he sees his spirit sealing you. It says... You know, back in the day when I went to high school, you wore the T-shirt, property of X. Well, I, I didn't wear an XL. I wore a large. But it says property of Jesus Christ on your soul. You are stamped with that. And every spiritual being can see that, both good and evil. So what we have to come back to in the church is the unshakable, unmovable confidence that God does really, truly love me. And he cares for me in where I am, what I'm going through, what I'm dealing with. And he cares about where this world is. And he cares enough about me to only give his best. When the church functions on this, when people step on the campus, they will feel the goodness of God. The one thing I will say to you about what this church has done just this past week is people felt the peace and the, the goodness of God in their schools. Whether they believe it, receive it, or not, they felt it. That's the kingdom expanding and God being glorified in the midst of it, as Jesus said, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, both now and forever. Everywhere we go in that confidence, the kingdom, it expands, whether by force or not by force. So we either push back against the darkness, against the evil, or we, whatever we do, when you step in with that confidence, the power and the glory go beyond what we do. So people would go, well, I so say you cooked some hamburgers, made some pork, and gave them a meal, big whip, and you gave them a you know, couple, couple gas cards and some cards to whatever. Yeah, that's that, that, yeah I don't get that. I, uh, you know what? That's the cup of cold water, people. That's the cup of cold water. In action, empowered by God's Spirit, doing what only He can do to people to connect the dots to go, maybe there is something to what they're saying. And when there is something to what they're saying, they will investigate wherever that is, however that happens. So we need to be able to do that. How does that happen? 
Well, it starts with our heart because our heart is what communicates to God. It's the very beginning part. Everything in the heart is how we draw near to God. It's how we love God. And it's how we love others. But for the heart to function, the only way the heart functions throughout the body is when the mind is renewed. And the mind gets renewed through the word of God. And so when the mind, the thoughts about God, thoughts of God, with the actions of God meet, that's what happens in the church and what was always designed to happen in the church and what we see at different points in history when the church embraces this. So um, all of God's word that starts and renews our mind it, it, it then somehow, some way, through God's spirit, it gets written on our heart, right? Your laws, your words, they're written on my heart. So my emotions attach back to my thoughts, which change my actions. And so we find all of that kind of simple. We all kind of get that. And, and, and one of the things I think that's happened in church sometimes is this, and, and I, I'll be honest with you, this was something I fell prey to, that if I, I believed if I got enough information and the right information, that it would affect my beliefs. And then I realized that's not necessarily the case. And for whatever reason, maybe that's why Paul wrote, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. It's not that you ignore one, but you can't just ignore the heart in favor of the mind or involve the heart and forget the mind because we have both. Some people's minds are so stinking open-minded open the brain falls out. <laughs> no, we are to know his thoughts, know his words so that we can imitate his actions. So what he did, we are to do. It's the heart that attaches to God. You know, I, the, one of the things that drives me crazy about modern prayer ministries is modern prayer ministries never functions on this. The best prayer you can ever pray is to have confidence to do what God tells you and make that choice. That's prayer. To say, Lord, in front of me stands death and light, life, right and wrong. I am choosing because I'm in you, life and right. I don't know if there's a greater prayer than that. Prayer today doesn't focus enough on choice, which is the greatest power God has given humankind. Secondly, I think one of the parts of understanding confidence in all of this is to kind of look at a picture and, and see like what, what Jesus and the church really looks like and how really intense that is. So we'll get to the end of this. And you notice throughout Revelation, there's always this kind of coming back to the bride and bridegroom. See, marriage from the very beginning was something really, really cool, and it was something that was designed, but it was, it was always to point us back to this overarching truth, the bride and the bridegroom. And I'm going to kind of close with this. And I, I think we need to recapture the concept, and I know all of you have it, as how God defines marriage. Um, it's designed to open our eyes, really, to the faithfulness of Jesus Christ as the bridegroom itself. So everything in an ancient marriage in Israel started with a covenant, right? starts with a covenant. So what would happen was the bridegroom would approach the father, and he would ask for permission to uh, really to, to marry or to enter into a, a marriage with the bride. And he would show up and he would uh, show the father all that he had to offer. So the initial, the initial arrangement started between the bridegroom and the father. And he would show the wealth he had to offer. Are you seeing what Jesus is doing? He's showing up to the father, 
And he's saying, I'm going to give you the greatest gift for this bride, my church, which is my life. So there's a covenant called the covenant of peace that is made between Jesus and God the Father on behalf of the bride. And so um, if the Father accepted the offer, which we know God does, then guess what the bride has? She gets to inherit everything that the groom had to offer. New creation, salvation, promises, all of this is what happens. And so what Jesus does is he steps forward to say, they have value in my eyes, and I am going to give you this, Father. And he accepts it, and a covenant is now made, a covenant that can't be broken. So if, um, if the covenant was accepted, here's what happened between the father and the bridegroom. They would pour a cup full of wine, and they would drink that cup. Does that sound like communion? We have, Jesus says at the Last Supper, this is the cup of a new covenant, an everlasting covenant in my blood. So you have this agreement that is, is, uh, is uh, occurring, I should say. And then before the groom would leave, because they, they, their, their engagement was a longer period, he would, um, he would give gifts back to, to the bride. So what gifts did Jesus give to the bride? Well, that's the Ephesians, the gifts that were given to the church, right? So he's given us these gifts that are part of the inheritance that we have, that are empowered by a spirit, that are based on a covenant that starts all the way from the very beginning of time at the very fall of man. And so um, the church would have this until the actual ceremony would come. Now, if you remember, back then, the bridegroom went out to meet the groom at the, at, the time, at the appointed time. There would be a call, here comes the bride. Remember the, the parable of the virgins that Zach, Zach taught on? So there would be a sound, and the bridegroom would not wait. The bridegroom would go out. What does that sound like? That sounds like the rapture of the church. And then those two would go together for a period of about seven days for their honeymoon, which sounds like quite a reception. That sounds like the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then they would start their life together, which sounds like new creation. When we grasp the truth of this and the picture of this, it continually reminds us that we can trust God, that he's had a plan in this from the very beginning. He is a God that has a plan. He's a God that works his plan. He's a God that has a plan for you. And he has set us up to succeed. All we have to do, sounding like Bill Murray, is have enough trust in him to take a step in what he's called us to do. And it's the step that says, I trust you to do enough what you tell me. And things start to change. I think that will happen massively just prior to his return. I think the church is going to grasp this again. I want us to grasp this again. I want us to be in, in line with the, the, the goodness of God. I want our hearts aligned with him. It's time to say bye-bye to this world. We're going to live in it, just not participate of it. Amen? Let's stand. Next week, we're going to see what this world looks like. So you get a little bit of a description of what you're getting yourself into. This is one of those times I can say, it's going to be awesome. It really is. But the question that all of us have before we leave is, how's my heart? You know, it's, it's, if the heart is so important to God, then clogging and breaking your heart becomes so important to Satan and the dark side. It doesn't want your brokenness healed. It wants every other possible way that cannot heal your brokenness 
to be laid out for you to keep you in a place of prison, of oppression, of struggle, so that when the accusing one shows up to say, see, he's not that good. See, he can't be trusted and lays things out for you, just like Eve, it's really easy to think, you know what, maybe he's holding out on me, and maybe there's a better way. And so what we find is that God brings people, his word, the church, all of that, in order to help in the process of healing our heart. It ultimately comes from a promise of God through his spirit as a result of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. All we have to do is say those deep places that maybe I'm not willing to give over to him, he keeps nudging us to say, trust me on this, just give it to me. So with head bowed and eye closed, those watching online, just allow the Holy Spirit to kind of search your heart a little bit and see if there's something. He'll feeling towards somebody, unforgiveness of something, abuse of the past over something. Something in your life relationship and say, Lord, I know I've struggled with it. And I want to just give it to you. And it's my first step in saying I truly can look in the mirror and say, I trust you and I have confidence in you. So Father, this morning, may you do that. May everyone here realize, those online, how precious and important they are to you. And may your goodness begin to be poured out into our lives. May your peace be the rule of our day, each and every day. Those in stress, may it go to the way. You are the one who has delivered and will continue to deliver us all the way into the place of promise. And so as we go, Father, again, I just pray that you will bless us and keep us pray that you cause your face to shine upon us and that you'll give us peace, not only today, but throughout this week as we come back next week to celebrate 20 years together as a church, working with and for you together as a family. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are dismissed. Have a great day.